Well, good morning, Life Church. Good morning. My name is Pastor Ian. I'll be your host this morning, and I'm excited about, about the fact that you are here and we are live this morning. This is Life Church live, raw, and uncut. You are getting to see everything as it happens right here in the service. So, welcome again this morning. I'm your host, Pastor Ian, and next to me is this wonderful lady who's who's over our women's ministry. Tony, how are you doing, Tony? I'll tell you what, I am feeling absolutely wonderful. The Spirit of the Lord is here, and I'll tell you something. Just being in the body of Christ has been such a blessing. You grow in your walk of faith. You grow spiritually. You grow in your life all together. So this is the place to be this morning. This is absolutely the place to be this morning. We're glad you're here. Hey, the service has started, so I want to encourage you to start a watch party, get your family, get your friends connected, the worship team is in place, and the music is going. We are ready to worship. Let's join in the worship, and I'll see you guys in a few moments. Your name. 
and worship. Lord, I feel. Lord, I feel. Come on, come on, let that get free. Free to dance. Join us here. Free to lift my hands and worship. Lord, I'm free. Oh, 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 oh. Lord, I'm free. Everybody sing it.
Our praise dispels everything that is negative, everything that it sets itself up, up against our God. Our praise dispels it. So right now, this place, let it be filled with light. Let it be filled with light. As you praise, His light and His presence fills this place. Do you believe that our God raised Christ from the dead? If you believe that, let me hear you. Let me hear your praise in this house. You believe that God raised Christ from the dead. So I ask you another question. Do you believe that same power is inside of you? That means there should be hope in this place. There should be faith in this place. Every fear is cast aside because there's nothing that we are afraid of with the God that lives inside of us. So this morning, let us continue to worship. And I ask you, if there's a mountain that you face this morning, let our faith and our hope rise that our God is able. Our God is able to push you up that mountain side. Our God is able to provide on the other side of the mountain. So right now, if you have a mountain that you're facing, it is more than you can manage. It's more than you can do. Come to this altar. Let us just pour out our love on our worship this morning for God, who we know is able. Let our faith rise this morning. Fill this place, Father God. We thank you for your presence here this morning, God.
lift our hands just for a moment. As you're lifting your hands this morning and as you're worshiping the Lord, the lifting of your hands represents the lifting of everything that declares to you that you have a limitation. And it is the lifting it up to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm giving this to you this morning because you, you are greater. So with my, with my hands lifted, it's my sacrifice, it's my worship. I'm giving unto you the things that try to dominate me because I know that you are greater than these things, oh God. And the context of the great I am comes out of where the children of Israel were bound and in trouble. And there was a king named Pharaoh that says, I'm greater than your great I am. But the living God shows up to Moses and says to him, I'm sending you to deliver my people because I am greater than their problems. I am greater than their circumstances. I am greater than their fears. I am greater than your worries. I am greater than the issues in your life. And so this morning as we lift our hands, we're lifting our hands to the one who says, I am that I am. Come on, give him a worship this morning. Come on, give him a worship this morning. He's greater. He's greater. He's so much greater. He's so much greater. Come on, sing that chorus. Greater than yes. the mountain that's in front of me. That's the God we serve. You are greater. You're so much greater. So much Come on, you're greater, Jesus. Greater than the power than any enemy that I face. Of the enemy. You are still greater. You are greater. Come on, worship him. So much greater. So much greater. Come on.
just give me some lights in the room real quick <laughs> I feel the Lord in this place I feel the Lord in this place somebody we're getting ready to cross the eyes and love on each other but I believe that the Lord is going to deposit something into your heart you watching online I believe the Lord is going to deposit something in your heart and it's for you it's something to encourage you it's something to tell you that he is in control it's something to remind you that you don't have to fear you don't have to worry you can sleep tonight because he's on the job and because he's going to drop that word in you i need you to do something i need you to take what he deposits in you and give it to someone this morning so as we get ready to cross the aisles meet and greet you online call your friends call your family and as the lord drops this word that he is in control come on somebody say he is in come on like you mean it he is in control and as you say that to one another encourage yourself as you encourage one another in the lord let's cross the aisles and let's meet and greet this morning Woo. Sister Tony, a little tactical difficulties, but we're here at Life Church. As you can see, we're fellowshipping right now, and we want you to get connected. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for one, just go to vvlifechurch.me forward slash connect and get connected. If you want to give, we believe here at Life Church that giving is a part of our worship. So to give to Life Church is vvlifechurch.me forward slash give. We're praying for you. All you have to do is just in the drop box, just click in, in, that, in that comment section that you, you want prayer. But we, we're looking for you. We want you. We want to connect with you. Fill out the connection card. It's in the link. We love you. Look, God is doing great and mighty things here at Life Church. Deliverance is happening. Happening. People's lives are being transformed and changed. I'm a living witness that no matter where you are, God will do it for you. So we're praying for you. We're praying for you. We're believing God for you. We're glad you're with us. Share. Go online. If you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram, YouTube, share. And let's get back to the worship. Pastor Paul is going to bring a mighty word you don't want to miss. Please share. Peppermint. If you can, you can have your seat this morning. If you can. If you can. If you that are watching online, if you can have your seat, you can go ahead and have your seat in your house. I know you're jumping. I know you're shouting like we are. I know you're just on fire like we are in here because the living God is in the room. Come on, touch three people and tell them God is in the room. No, 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 no. no. You got to say it like you got an old Baptist kind of fire in you. God is in the room. Come on, come on. Now you got to say it like you mean it. God is in the room. See, back in the old church, we used to take off right there and somebody would... Val, you know what I'm talking Don't about. Get <laughs> I'm getting myself together. Please. Well, good morning, Life Church. <laughs> Let me put my dignified self back on. You guys are looking beautiful. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. You guys are looking amazing, a beaut just simply beautiful, simply wonderful, and it is such a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord this morning. To all of our first time guests, uh, those of you that are returning, you've, you visited one time before you say, you know what, I wanna check these people out again. We wanna celebrate both of you. We wanna thank God for you. Come on Life Church, let's give our first time guests a wonderful hand. You watching online, we're also celebrating you. If you're watching for the first time, put it in the comment box right there. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube and let them know that this is your first time, we're excited. Also, you can fill out a connection card, whether you're online or in this room, in the seat pocket right in front of you. If you're in here, there is a connection card on the front side. Guys, we're going to receive this at the end of the service. And this is a great way for you to connect with Life Church. This is a great way for you to receive prayer. 
this is a great way for us to connect with you and help you to walk through your process and your walk with the Lord. So in the front of that, if you can fill out as much information as possible, and at the end of the service when the offering is received, we'll collect that on the back. Don't worry about the back right now. You'll get an opportunity after service. And also in front of you, there's your offering envelope. If you're going to go ahead and start completing that so that at the end of the service, you would be ready for our offering. Amen? Amen? All right, guys. Y'all know how we do here. Because last week, I told you guys, Pastor Paul sent his greeting, sent his love. He was preaching at, at Word of Truth in Dallas. But he had something on him that was such on fire that he called before I got into the pulpit to say to, tell, to say to them Ian you got to tell them that I have a word from the Lord and they need to be here to get that you guys remember me saying something like that around, around that area last week come on how many of you guys remember that well Pastor Paul is here this morning and I don't know about you but I'm like the people in the book of Ezra Pastor Paul when, the, when, when, when um, Ezra woke up excuse me, excuse me in the book of Nehemiah when Ezra got into the pulpit the people told him bring the book because we were ready life church are you ready for the word life church are you ready for the word if you're ready for the word let's stand to our feet and shout pastor paul bring the book come on bring the book Woo. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. You know what? Why don't we just stay standing so I can just read. Um, the, the book is actually on the iPad. If that's all right. Amen. <laughs> and so if you have your Bibles, um, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 19. It's going to be on your screen as well. And um, God has a word for us today. And I'm excited about it. It's going to be good times. Amen. So here we go. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 19. It says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say? I am. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell or Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Nobody greater than him. Father, we bless you and we thank you, God, for your word to us today. Thank you, Lord God, that you are building your church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against us that God you are building your church and you have given us keys to the kingdom to release heaven on this earth and so father I pray this day that you would break your truth to us that you would give us revelation Lord God that would enlighten our soul cause our faith to rise and for us to step into the position that you have for us Lord so, Father, meet us in this place. Thank you, God, for touching the hearts of your people. That those who were troubled, Lord God, that you gave them peace. That, Father, those who came in this morning confused and, and worried, that, God, you, you gave, gave calm to their soul. And I pray now, Jesus, that as we hear your word, that you would instruct our lives and that you would bring your change in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, everybody. You can have a seat. Praise the Lord. Nobody greater than him, Val. I tell you. Hallelujah. 
good to see you guys. Missed you guys last week. We're in, um, in Dallas with Pastor Che and Evan and the guys out there. It was a powerful time. Um, we really felt at home. It's good when you go to somewhere else to minister and you kind of feel the same kind of vibe. You know what I mean? And so it was a very powerful time. Thank you for praying for us. And um, thank you, Pastor Ian, for bringing that word last week. How many of you were here last week? Did you hear from the Lord last week? Let's just give the man of God a thank you. Thank you, sir. Like that jacket too, man, looking sharp. Kataya, you're working on him. <laughs> so I want to speak to you today, and over the next couple of weeks, we'll be sharing from this idea of the church, the ecclesia, designed to win. Do you know that when God was building the church, when he thought of this idea called the church, he built us to win. He didn't set us up to lose. You know that Ian. He set us up and designed us to win. And therefore it's important for us to step into the revelation of the church that we can find our place, our position, or, or fit in the body of Christ and that we can be part of God's design to win. Touch the person beside you and say, you were designed to win. Let me give you a, a little bit about the church in the United States. All across the world, the, the church of Jesus Christ is expanding and growing. And they say the center of Christianity has shifted. There are miracles and signs and wonders happening in many places in the world. And when, those of us who are in touch with the mission field hear these stories and these testimonies. And we're like, what? This is amazing. And we're like, what about here? What about in the, like in the early 1900s where there were revivals sweeping across the islands and the country and people were being delivered and set free? Do you know when you read the history of when the revivals hit this country, people would come into the church building at night drunk and leave sober. People would come in blind and healed. People demonized, set free. There was something happening because the move of God was here. That's not what we're designed to live in. But what has happened here? I'll give you some updates on what's going on in the United States. And this is what's tricky. It, it, it did the last um, census last year and they did their surveys. Seven out of ten Americans identify themselves as Christian. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, there are still people who say, you know what? I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Amen. Amen? You're like shocked. Like, no way. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 that's what they say. <laughs> I'll just give you some more numbers. 25, almost 25%, said they're religiously unaffiliated. I know it's kind of growing, where people are like, well, I don't want to identify with a religious organization. You know, I love Jesus, but <laughs> all these institutional religion is not my thing. It started to switch last in 2019 and 2018, though that number is going up, and then something happened. People start to say, you know what, I want to connect. So it lost a few percentage points. But here it is. The National Congregational Study Service says there's an estimated 380,000 churches in the United States. 380,000 churches in the United States. Think about that for a minute. That's a lot of churches. Before the outbreak, 80%, before the pandemic, I'm saying, this is the numbers from that, 80% of churches had memberships of less than 200, half of them of less than 100. So you have 880,000 churches, majority of them are small congregations ministering to their people and their community and touching lives. But here is a, a statistic that's very, very almost could be bothersome. Even though 70% of Americans identify themselves as Christian, only about a third attend church every week. Are you tracking with me? So praise God, everybody's like, woo, we're believers. But only about a third are the regulars. And you and I know that. We have people who stop in once per month, Sometimes twice per year, you know, and some every other week. So the study is not telling you something we don't know. 
But here is a big study that really spoke to my heart. In 2015, only 4% of churches were multiplying. That means only 4% of these 380,000 churches were birthing churches that were birthing churches. 4%. It's reminding me of the statistics for Christians. That it was less than 5% of believers lead other people to the Lord. And less than 1% of believers were making disciples who would make disciples. But Jesus wants us to multiply. He said, be fruitful and what? Something's about to change. Anyway, guess what? Last year, that number that moved from 4% is now up to 7%. Hallelujah. Let me, let me tell you what that means. It means for every one percentage point upward, it means 3,000 more churches are being planted. Are you hearing me? So even though the religious denominational churches, the institutional churches are declining, facts, but there is a movement of churches multiplying that are not identified with the institutional church that are multiplying. My brothers, my sisters, my friends, those watching, God has designed us to win. He's building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Everything that matures multiplies. Think about it for a minute. Trees, animals, us, we multiply. And so therefore, in this next season and wave of our journey at life, we're entering into the season of multiplication. Touch a person beside you. Tell them it's time to multiply. You're like, oh my God. I came for a good sermon to soothe my heart and give me a little inspiration to, to make it through the week. And here he comes with a word from Genesis that says, be fruitful and multiply. What? The kingdom of God is advancing forcefully. And the forceful will take hold of it. And it's all right. The rest of us can watch and kind of go for the ride. But it's all good. Amen? But it's the season that we're in. Right now we're getting ready to start our small groups. And our theme for the small groups is going to be discipleship. We're going to teach you and walk you through discipleship so that you can not only be a disciple, effectively growing in the character, the competences, and in the content of God's word, but be able to multiply to others. For some of you, it starts in your family, and you start to disciple them. For some, it may be neighbors. It's for some, it may be friends at work. It may be some, whoever and wherever, multiply. And then as a church... We're preparing ourselves that in this next season, we're going to multiply. Amen? Amen. You're like, oh boy. You still ready for the word? All right, I'll give you the end from the beginning. All right, let's take a look at this text. So Jesus now, he says to them that in verse 18, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus says he will build his church. The problem we have is when we think we have to build the church. It's when we start to get our God complex that says we can design it, we can make it, we can take all the fancy stuff, and we can turn the church into what we have made it to be, which is some kind of commercialized institution. But instead, Jesus says, I am building my church. And here's the best news. The gates of hell, the authorities of hell, the powers of darkness will not prevail against you. Charmaine said it perfectly earlier. She says, listen, when Jesus is on your side, the light of God shines through you. Can I ask you this question? Is light intimidated by darkness? Can darkness overcome light? No. 
And therefore, why should we be afraid of Satan and all his hordes? Why should we be afraid of the demon powers of hell when the light of God shines in you? The Bible says that... In, I don't think, you, when you get it, some of you are going to just jump and shout and scream. People are going to be, I mean, it's going to snap in your spirit. Isaiah 60 says it this way. It says, see, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. The darker the world gets, the brighter the light shines. We were in um, Tanzania. I remember the first time we were going to 10 hour trek. We we're doing some church planting among the Mazai. And we we're out into the, into the like, deep. We pulled over, got into these little tent type things. <laughs> And I was on the truck, and I looked up in the sky, and I tell you, it was like somebody took spray paint. I went, shh. The amount of stars it was brilliant. I was like, wow. But if you and I go to LA today, we won't see much stars in the sky. Are you tracking with me? The darker the night, the brighter you shine. Do not be afraid of the chaos and the crisis and the stresses and the anxieties produced in the world. Do not be afraid or terrified or made anxious of the shifting of this and that and all the... I mean, we're living in a season, at least this generation has never had it before, where you have so many things happening at one time. It's like you're hard-pressed on every side. Anybody feel that way, where you've been hard-pressed on every side? Not just one problem that you're trying to overcome, but there's one here. Then, oh my God, there's one here. There's one here. There's problems in the economy. There's problems in the social justice. There's, there's problems there all around, in families, in health. Hard-pressed. But the Bible says, we may be hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We may be perplexed, but not in despair. We may even be struck down, but we're not abandoned. Why? Because greater is he that is where? In you than he that is in the world. So therefore, do not be discouraged. Do not be overcome. Just understand that our hope is no longer to be put in the world's economy or in the world's system. Our hope is, has to be shifted to that which will last forever. And Jesus says, I am building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So therefore, our hope has to be in God. Our hope has to be in what God is building in this world and not the systems of the world. We've got to make a shift in our mentality. This is our season to what people say pivot, where one time you're relying on this. Now guess what? You, say, you know what? That didn't work out too well for me. Right? So let me just make the flip and put my trust in the living God. Some of you say, well, the church ain't that pretty. I know. We've had a sordid history. No doubt. I studied church history. It ain't all that beautiful all the time. But I remember this word that encourages my heart. In Ephesians 5 verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Can I tell you, Jesus is building his church and he's going to present us to himself as a radiant church. That means he's working on you and me. That means he's not finished with you and me yet. That means he's not done with his church yet. It means that God is still working. It means that, can you imagine, if the church was what it was supposed to be, guess what? It'll be over. See, the wedding can't start till the bride gets there. Hello. And so therefore, you, we are in the preparation stage for when Jesus finishes his work in us. That he can present us to himself as a radiant church without spot or blemish or any other wrinkle. He is preparing you. Tell the person beside you, he ain't done with me yet. Right? Just give me some time. He's still working on me. See? Because when he's finished preparing his bride, he will present us to himself. 
So do not lose hope in the church. Do not take the, the words of the naysayers who try to say, well, don't listen to the church or this and that and try to minimize the church or reduce the church's influence because it's a ploy of Satan to allow your minds and the minds of those you love to be shifted from that which would really save them. You're like, what? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Let me tell you. Do you remember when Noah was building that ark? They laughed at him. Foolish man. Right? Until the rain came. And the flood rose. I don't know about you. I've made this, I've made this comment often, but it's a fact. Inside that ark was all kinds of animals and creatures. In this ark where the door was closed. I'm, I'm telling you, they must have had a, a window or something only. Because the, the nitrite buildup in there could have made that thing explode. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you're tracking where I'm, what I'm, yeah? Are you, are you getting me? Can you imagine every kind of animal dung that you can imagine? That would have been stink to high heaven. But let me ask you this question. If there was a flood outside and the whole world was being destroyed, where would you prefer to be? In that ark. I can put up with the mess in the church because I prefer to be in the church than in the world. I prefer to be in the church than in some bar on a Saturday night. I prefer to be in the church than be strung out and lost. I prefer to be in the church than, than addicted to something else. Hey, I prefer to be here. How many of you are glad you're here today? How many of you are glad that, you know what, I have a place to come. I have a place to be. That hey, that no matter what my week is like, I can get to Sunday morning because I can assemble with some people that will cause heaven to come on earth and change everything. I prefer to be here. That's just the introduction. Can I preach to you now? So I want to start this series off by answering this first question, that when Jesus said the word church, that was the very first time that word was used in the New Testament. It was the very first time it was used in, as he was doing his ministry. Was he introducing a new concept? What was he coming with when he says, upon this rock, I will build my church? What is this thing, church, that he was talking about? He didn't say, on this rock, I'm going to build my new religious order. He didn't say, upon this rock, I'm going to build my new nation of Israel. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. What is it? Because if we understand what Jesus was referring to, it would help us to understand who we really are. Because I believe if you define yourself wrong, you will operate wrong. If you perceive who you are as not what you really are, then you're going to do what you're really not supposed to do. Are you, are you with me? If I think that this watch is really a bell, then I'm going to destroy it. If you think the church is not what Jesus thinks it is, we could be missing some more of what God has in store for us. Are you with me? So let's break it down for a minute. Can I, I'm going to just teach you for a second. So the word there, and you know, I'm not somebody who likes to like talk Greek because it's Greek to you and it's Greek to me. But every once in a while, just for you to understand the root of something, we have to break it down. And so the word we use, what well, the word is there is called ekklesia. Ekklesia. That's not too hard to say, right? And it's important because that's who we are. We are the church. We are the ecclesia. And that's based on two root words. One is ek, which is basically mean from or out. Everybody say out. out. See? So ek is out or from. And then the, the klesia part comes from kaleo, which means to be called. Right? So literally, when he says the church, he's speaking of a called out people. Are you with me? The ecclesia is the called out ones. Now, in the Roman times, there was this... It was a common term for the ecclesia because they would have these assemblies of representatives. Like, you know, we have our Congress and everybody gathers and they make decisions and represent the community. And I was always taught and thought that when Jesus was using the word ecclesia, he was making reference to 
that kind of body, you know, a governing body with, of people with authority who would represent their city. And yeah, I'm sure there is some of that in there. But yet, if you look at just the essence of the word, the called out ones, you and I are the called out ones. He says, I'm going to build my church, my gathering of the called out ones. It's so funny. He's like, I'm going to call some people out and bring them in. And that's my church. Called out. So, David, if I, 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 I called you out, can you come out of your seat and, and come here? And then, you know, it is not good for a man to be alone. So, David, could, you, could we call out your, your, your dear wife, Brenda? And, yeah, give them a hand as, they, as, as, as they're being called out. George, I like your pretty green shirt. Could, you, could I call you out? And, um, and your wife in her beautiful dress and just kind of like, yeah, just called out once. There you go. There you go. Yuri, could I call you out? from where you are, and if you could bring your dear wife, if you can get her to come on the stage to, to be called out as well. There we go. Give them a hand. Come on, come on. Come on, let's celebrate these guys. But we don't, we're not leaving anybody out. Vonda, could I call you out from, from your seat? And just, yeah, 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 come on up, Vonda. She's like, who, me? I know, that's what I said when Jesus called me to. Who, me? <laughs> come on up, come on up. All right, tell you what, since they're on that side, I'm going to have you go on that side with them, that everybody can see everybody. Now, let me ask you this question. When they responded to the call of God, I'm just representing it, I'm not really mean. But anyway. <laughs> when, they represent, when they responded to the call, they had to come out from where they were, and then they gathered here. Could we gather in a little closer? There we go, closer. Yeah, there, there you go. So now, now I'm asking them to assemble. When Jesus said he was building his church, what he was saying is, I'm building an assembly of people that I've called out from different places. Question is this, could you be here and still there at the same time? That is the dilemma of the church today. Jesus said in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, praise the one who has called you out of darkness into his light. You see, when you've been called out of something, you've been called into something. And the problem we have is that we want it both in darkness and light at the same time. You really can't have your cake after you've eaten it. It's gone. So therefore, once you've been called out, you've got to really come out, all the way out, to be gathered in to what God has. Jesus said it this way. He said, come out from among them and be separated. You're like, what? But I want to still be in the world. I, it's not, I don't know how it's possible. See, I've done the dance. Where it's like, okay, Saturday night in the world, Sunday morning in the church, Monday morning, Monday morning. Monday. It's exhausting. How many of you tried that? I mean, I know I'm not the only Christian who has done that. Who you, 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 it's okay. I, I really want to hold on to this part of the world. But Jesus, I love you. Da, da, da. It wears you out. Can you imagine them running back and forth from their seat and here? So therefore, we've got to make a decision that when we are called out, that we do what? Come out, all the way out, and say, you know what? I've left that, and I've come into this. I've left that. And I've come into this. The question is, what is God calling you out of to get into all that he has for you? Because you can't experience everything he has for you till you leave where you were. Amen? Beautiful, guys. Thank you so much. Please have a seat. Thank you, sir. Whew. We're getting somewhere called out see so you got to come out one of the things we said about our church is that it's built upon those three three actions those three basic foundations that we've been called and when we are called we get connected and when we get connected we get commissioned to call others to get connected to get commissioned are you tracking that so you've been called 
to get connected and then commissioned. What are you commissioned to do? To call others, to get connected, to be commissioned. One day you're going to stand and say, you know what? I've been called by God. And I said, yes. I got connected with some amazing people in the Lord. And I'm happy. And I've been commissioned to reach others and call them out as well. That's the, the passion of what we do. But there is more. Tell the person beside it, there is more. So the church is ecclesia, is this called out assembly, this summoned assembly. It is a gathering of God's people, and these people, the Bible says, has authority to operate in the kingdom. And I thought for many, many years that that was the only or the first mention of the church in the Bible. But the truth is, it was the first mention in the New Testament wonder. And in all through the New Testament, we're referred to as a church, this ecclesia, this assembling of called out ones. But it was not the first time it was mentioned in the Bible. It wasn't even the first time that Jesus and his disciples would have read about it. So when he said it, it wasn't strange to his disciples. They didn't go, what are you talking about, Jesus? They were like, they seem to have been with it. Do you know why? There is something, if we... Remember, when Jesus was here, they were under Roman, um, you know, what we would call today, colonization. Like, Rome owned everything. They're all subject to Rome. Isn't that true? And therefore, when you're under the, the power of another power, you adopt some of their culture, and often you have to adopt their language. Even though these guys were Jews, the New Testament is written primarily in what? Greek. Are you tracking with me? So therefore, these guys were raised in a culture where they had to learn Greek and they had to speak Greek. So, hmm. Hit me like a bolt of lightning. There was something that we call the Septuagint. It is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, David. So it is more than likely that these guys were reading from a Greek translation of the Old Testament, right? It was about 700 years before Christ. The, these scholars came together and they translated it in this common language, like English, see? I mean, I'm from Jamaica, right? Can I tell you? Well, God bless the people who first lived there who were all killed, but, um, you know, we became an English colony. Therefore, we learned the Queen's English, right? So we say schedule and not schedule, right? Till we got to the States and... We pronounced it better, you know what I mean? Um, so wherever you're colonized by, you pick up that language and that people. So what happened is they were reading and speaking in Greek. So I started saying, let's check the Greek translation of the Old Testament and see if this word ekklesia was there. Huh. And guess what? All over the Old Testament church was there you're like what let me read to you and give you an example of it the very first mention and i taught you before the power of the first mention it helps you set a, a, a precedence and a stage for it stay with me here we go in deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 10 to 14 moses is speaking he says remember the day you stood before the lord your god at horeb when he said to me assemble the people before me Literally, he was saying, call the people out to a sacred assembly. Over and over again, it says, when they came before him to hear my words, so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. So he says, call this assembly of my people. So everybody had to do what? Come out to this assembly. For what purpose? that they could teach him, teach them his God's word, and that they could teach their children. Hmm. It sounds to me like, if I translate it to today, we call people out to a sacred assembly that you can hear God's word, revere him, and that you're able to then go teach other people and your children. Huh. It wasn't that new after all. 
It was actually in the mind of God from before. Let me show you some of the illustrations of, of when that word church was used in the Old Testament. All through the Bible, the, the people of God were referred to as the assembly of God's people or the church, what we would translate as church today. They refer to it as a day of the great assembly. In Psalm 22, 22, it says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly or the ecclesia, I will praise you. Why do we praise him? Because when the assembly of God's people come together, what do we do? Praise him. Yeah. Right? It's going to hit you in a minute. In Psalm 22, verse 25, it says, From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. Where is it that we come to the altar and make vows to Jesus and make commitments to Jesus? Where? In the great what? Assembly. In Psalm 40, verse 9 and 10, it says, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips O Lord, as you know, in where? The assembly. What are we here? Assembled. Think about it for a minute. It's going to get better. Jesus is multiplying assemblies of his people all over the world. You and I are a part of a great assembly of God's people. This is an assembly. The church is not a building. And I'm going to mess with somebody now. Are you ready? If we've got the root of what Jesus is saying, the church is when the people of God assemble. like, we are the church. When you assemble. <laughs> I'm the church. No. He says where two or three are gathered. You've got to have an assembly. Are you tracking with me? You have to have an assembly. In Roman culture, Rome, as you know, dominated the, the known world at that time. And therefore, they instituted their laws and their governance all over the world. But of course, they weren't every single way, even though they run it. Do you know, they had a rule, I can't remember the name of it, that when there were two Romans in any space, they had to operate by Roman law. So the Bible says that when they, when they took Paul captive, and he says, I'm a Roman citizen. They're like, oh my God. Because they could no longer treat him as if he was anybody else because now all the rules and the laws of Rome would apply to him. Why? Because he's a Roman. Are you with me? Because once there were two of them there, they said, hey, Rome is here. Can I tell you? Once there are two of you anywhere, the church of Jesus Christ is there. It only works though when you assemble. Are you with me? And it's like it just opened my eyes. I just noticed it. Do you know other people do this? I never didn't even realize it. Like, so I'm a part of our local Rotary Club, right? And uh, they have meetings on a Tuesday. I haven't been able to go recently. I have another appointment then. But do you know if I get together at some other Rotarians, they check it as you've been, you had a meeting? Isn't that crazy? You know, you, those of you who know it. Why? Because somehow, if you're a member of this thing called the body of Christ, if you're in Christ, when you get together with somebody else, something special happens. Something supernatural happens because Jesus shows up there. The assembly. Are, are, is it catching to you yet? All right, let me give you some more before we apply it to our lives. So I read to you Deuteronomy is when they spoke about that assembly at Horeb. Now let's read how Hebrews refers to that assembly. It says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches a mountain, it must be stoned to death. 
The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. You see, when they came to Mount Horeb, the presence of God was so thick. People, they were like, oh. You see, when we get the presence of the Lord, we're like, we. They weren't going, we. They were like, scared. Because if they broke any, bam, they're dead. It says, however, in verse 22, we should have it on the screen in a minute. Hebrews 8, 12, verse 22, it says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly or festive gathering. You have come to the church or the assembling of the firstborn whose names are registered or enrolled in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Let me explain this to you in plainer English. When we assemble, we are not just assembling with ourselves. What this says, that when the church comes together, we have not come to some mountain of doom and gloom, a mountain of fear, but when we come together, we have come to the living God, that the very angels of the living God are here with us, that the very presence and the power of God is here with us, that when we assemble, we have come to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant. What does that mean? It means that when you come together, I don't know if you know what the blood of Abel represents. The blood of Abel represents condemnation. The blood of Jesus represents grace. So when we come together, I'm going to blow your mind again. When, you, when we come together, the Bible says we come to the living God, to the mediator of a better covenant, which means what? The blood of Jesus cleanses us from every sin. When we come together, God makes us holy when we assemble. You're like, what do you mean, Pastor? I don't know if you realize it. First John chapter 1 says, If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship, what? One with another. And the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from every sin. When you assemble and you come into the presence of God, available to you and I, whenever we assemble, okay, see, there's somebody watching who you haven't been to church for a minute because you're so guilty over what you did the other day and you feel unworthy. Guess what? We're all unworthy. And it's only by the blood of Jesus can we enter into the holy assembly. Only by the mediation of a better covenant and the cleansing flow of the blood of Jesus that we can come into the assembly and the presence of God and not be afraid when the presence of God comes. That's what you come to when you assemble. You see, over this last year and a half, the church or the assembling of the church has been impacted and scattered. Just like in Acts chapter 8 when the persecution came, the assembly of the church was what? Impacted and they what? Scattered. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 that everywhere they went, they preached the gospel and started a new assembly. And therefore, it refers to bless the church that meets at your house and give greetings to the assembly that meets at this person's house. So for those watching online, I'm going to ask you to do this. When you're watching online, get somebody else to watch with you. That there'll be two, at least, of you. Tell me the truth. I've watched online. And it's cool. Amen? Amen? And I've watched online with my family, and it's better. Come on, talk to me. If, have you ever watched online by yourself, in your kitchen, while you're washing, while you're driving, and it's great, you get blessed, praise God. But don't you experience the difference 
when even if you're online and there's another believer with you and you pray before you start, that immediately your focus is different. The sense of God's presence is different. The power of what's happening is different. Why? Because you've assembled and where two or three assemble together in my name, Jesus says, I am there with you. There is purpose in the assembly. It is to hear God's word together. It is to praise God what? Together. There is a power in doing it what? Together. We really mean it when we say it is better what? Together. I'm going to wrap up with this just for us to pray. There is power in the assembly. In Matthew 18, verse 18 to 20, it says these words. It's echoing what he told the disciples in Matthew 16. He says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth would be loosed in heaven. Literally what that means is whatsoever, it's, it's a weird way it's, it's written in the Greek. It says, whatever has been bound in heaven, you can bind it on earth. Whatsoever has been loosed in heaven, you can loose it on earth. And it says this, again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, how many? Agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Here is the power of the assembly. In the power of the assembly is this, that you are able to access and bring heaven on earth that thy kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven that when you are assembled the bible says one can put a thousand to flight two can put legions fleeing when we are assembled demons are nervous when we're assembled the reason it tries to stop you from assembling because it knows that there is more power when we are assembled than when we are dispersed the devil knows that if two of us agree that the authority of God is manifested through us when we are what? Together than when we are separate. God says, I'm going to back you up when you're together. Amen. See? That's the power of it. The power of the assembly is that it allows the release of God's heaven to be on earth. And here's the best part about it. When we assemble it, it allows for a manifestation of his presence in the midst of us. Come on, you know what it's like. You remember what it was like in worship when there was this sense of his presence? Yes. Pastor Ian got all excited. Man, he's in the room. Why? Because he became acutely aware of his presence. And that only happens when we what? Assemble. Together, we've been designed to win but only together. It just opened my eyes to a lot of text. Ephesians 3.20 says that we will know the power and then it says this way, together with all the saints. Huh. Some things only happen what? Together. Tell the person beside you, I'm glad you're here. Because if they weren't here, we wouldn't be able to do this together. We look forward to the gathering because it's in the gathering that we experience God together. Let me invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to tap into the power of being together. Thank you, Lord. Did you get this? Yeah? I mean, I mean, there's a, so much to the power of what it means to be together. The reason we're having small groups is to get us to be together. The reason we, we promote and say have a watch party is that you can be together. Because a certain amount of power is released only when we are together. I know somebody's saying, well, I don't really like people and don't want to but I'm saying hey step out in faith and experience what God has for you which only happens together next couple of weeks we're going to dive into the scriptures that speaks about when 
God released gifts into the church. And again, whenever you hear the word church, think of it as the assembly of God's people who have been called out. And it makes more sense though. It's like it says, he gave to the church, to the to the assembly of his called out ones, certain gifts to equip us that we can become mature and not lack anything. That we won't be tossed to and fro. He designed us. So he's, he calls some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? To equip the saints. So that when we're together, power can be released. Ministry can happen. Healing can take place. Deliverances. Wholeness. Despair being removed when we're what? Together. Let me invite you, if you would, just close your eyes for a second. I'm going to invite you to to make a fresh commitment to the Lord and to what he's building in the world today. So God is building his church and I'm inviting you to make a commitment to the Lord and to the church, the assembly of God's people. That he can build us together into his holy assembly. We're inviting us to, to open our, our hearts beyond ourselves and what's good for me and my family. To say, God, you are doing something amazing in this world and you're building your church. God, allow me to, to be fully partnered into that with you. God, I want to build with you what you're building in the world. Would you make a fresh commitment today to partner with God in what he's doing? Maybe you're here and or you're listening and you're like, well, God has been calling me out of some things. That I can come into this community in a more committed way. That's the first level of commitment. To say yes to the Lord and to, to turn away and to repent and to reject the ways of the world and the flesh and selfishness. And say, God, I surrender my life completely to you. I give you my all. Lord, I turn from sin and wickedness and I turn to you. And Jesus would embrace you to come into the assembly of his people by the blood of Jesus, not by our merit or our self-effort or our performance, but by his precious blood. And if you today need to apply to the blood in this place, or if you're watching, if you right where you are would say, Jesus, would you just forgive me? I turn from sin and I turn to you. I will follow you, Lord God. And you give your heart and your life to him in this moment, in this very second, the power of God would come and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from every sin that you can be part of his holy assembly would you do that today would you right where you are experience the power of the holy ghost and then you would just surrender to the lord there's some of you in this room that you are being called by god right now to walk away from from the things of this world to not be dancing between the two and to say god i surrender to you i live for you right where you are just do it right there just say, I surrender, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just help those who need our help. If you could, everybody, just repeat this simple prayer with me. There are some who need the words to articulate, to express what's in their heart. And so if you could all join me in, in praying. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. And this day, I turn from sin. I turn from selfishness. And I give myself to you. I respond to your call to follow you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to save me. Please, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And I receive your gift of eternal life. I acknowledge that you are Lord and I will follow you. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. For those of you who, who that was your commitment prayer. At the end, Pastor is going to lead you to just let us know by finger the connection card. We want to pray for you at the end of our service. And for all of us who are believers, I'm going to challenge you today. How many of you would say, you know what? God, because you know, the Psalm says, I'm going to fulfill my vows in the assembly of the people. How many of you make a fresh vow to God to say, God, that I'm going to commit myself to your, to your church. That God, as you build your church, I'm going to build with you. I'm not going to be just a consumer, but I'm going to be a participator. I'm not going to be somebody who just receives a blessing of the church, but I'm going to be one who shares in the responsibility of the church. How many of you would say that with me today? Even if you have done before, just renew, just renew that 